everyone, welcome to our YouTube channel. We trust that you're ready for an incredible message. If you want to enjoy the full service, click the link below. But let's get ready for an inspirational message. And uh, hello everybody online. It's so good to have you with us today. We've got a whole heap of people in the room tonight. And uh, we're excited about that. And uh, we're excited that something exciting is going to happen. And uh, I, I know that all of you sitting at home online are thinking you got it right today because the weather sucks. <laughs> and while you had your duvet and your coffee, it's still warmer in here and there's a lot of exciting things happening. So uh, well done for joining us online. But next week we expect you in here, right? Cool. Look at your husband and say, yes, dear, we'll be at church. Look at your teenagers and say, suck it up, we'll be at church. Look at yourself and say the duvet is not, bring your duvet with you. No, don't bring your duvet with you. Uh, hey, listen, we're excited about the series that we're going to start today. And I do, I do need to confess something, though. It wasn't supposed to be a series. Now, um, what happened was, is I felt strongly that I needed to kind of preach and teach on this particular topic. And, and as I started getting ready for it, and I was about three quarters of the way through, I realized that the one-part series was going to need to be a two-part series. And then, because I just, you know, what you know about preachers is that all of us, we have far too much to say. <laughs> And then I figured, well, it'll be a two-part series. When I told the staff that there was going to be a two-part series, they just looked at me and went, whatever, it's going to be a three-part series. <laughs> so that's why none of them are getting increases next year. And they, it's like, they're all fired. They don't have faith in me. Look at the person next to you and say, have faith in him. Go and tell them. Now, yeah, you all know that there's going to be a three-part series. That's all good. Uh, we'll do our best to, to, to do that. But I'm really amped because I want to share something with you that's so important contextually as we face the season we're in. And uh, so let's pray first and we'll do that. Father, we just thank you so much for all you do in and through us. And I pray today above everything that you will transform who we are from the inside out. Let this not just be us getting together for an intellectual conversation, but Father, let your Holy Spirit shift us. Help us to be better in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So no matter where you find yourself today, those of you online, those in the room, this season has been interesting, hasn't it? I mean, really, it has been massively disruptive. And it doesn't matter how we look at it and how we skin this particular conversation. It's been properly disruptive in every single context. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, what we would do is we'd go in a car. We would normally look for our keys, right? Like, have I got my car keys, my house keys, and, my, and oh, my phone, and, and we'd run and get a phone. And then if we forgot any of those things, we'd get in the car and go, oh, freak, I, I need to stop quickly. You get out the car. I've got to get my, my phone because you left your phone aside. But now it's all different. Let's be honest, when we stop before we leave the house, we're about to leave, we go, oh, freak, I forgot my, my, my mask. <laughs> Who would have thunk that? Thunk is a word. Yes, Who would have thunk that? Who would have thought about that? Who would have thought like we're going to be arguing about a mask? But everywhere we go, we wear masks. Yeah. I've even got mine with me right now. I don't know why. It's in my pocket. <laughs> Habit. I've got my mask. Hey, but listen, we do this all the time. Like pre-COVID, it was, it was a miracle if our teenage boys washed their hands. <laughs> We'd like, 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 we'd say to them, have you washed your hands? Oh, 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 and off they go. Now, it's always being sanitized. They're washing their hands all the time. It's like, it's like COVID changed the hygiene of our teenage boys. Maybe not the showers, but the rest, it's all changed. Isn't that true? And, and, and let's face it, come on, come on. I know, I, know, I know there's some of you that do this. When you sanitize your hands, come on, you go like this. Maybe I've got a problem, but I love the smell of sanitizer. And now they even put flavorants in them and smells. Yeah. Yeah. Strawberry, all I smell is alcohol. <laughs> I'm like, woo, it's going to be a good day. I, I did that just before I came up here. It's wonderful. <laughs> no, I didn't. But hey, listen, you get addicted to these things. And, we, and it's awesome. Your hands are always sanitized. And wherever you go, and, and, then, and then when people come to your house, we never ask people to make sure their hands were clean when they came to visit us. <laughs> come in. Yeah. Hands. Yeah. Now. Yeah. And when last did we say that we can't visit someone because we don't know where they've been? Yeah. I mean, when I grew up, it didn't matter where they'd been. Yeah. In fact, the worse they'd been, the more exciting the visit was. <laughs> and we live in this disrupted world. But there's also the flip side of that, we've, we, we, where things have gone hopelessly wrong. So many people have lost their jobs. Their businesses are under pressure. Many industries have literally shut down because of, of a lack of being able to, to connect. There are all sorts of challenges with regards to finances. The economy is tough. And we look at all of those things. And if we're not careful, we start to use statements like this. It's not fair. Yeah. It's not fair. I've worked really hard in my business. And because of COVID and all the things that have happened, I've lost my business. It's not fair. 
We've looked at conversations like, uh, you know, my friends were healthy and strong and yet they still got COVID. They had a vaccine and they are still getting sick. It's not fair. We look at the fact that airplanes can be packed to capacity. An incubator of germs can be packed to capacity, but you can't meet in church. It's not fair. And I find that particularly interesting because uh, when you stand in a queue, I don't know whether you've flown anywhere recently, but it's quite interesting because you go to the airport and there are signs everywhere, yeah. social distancing. I mean, it's, they even put stuff on the floor to remind you. So like you stand on one bit and you, and you kind of step over you, and you step back because you can see the stickers. And, and then when someone stands in between this sticker and that sticker, it's like, whoa. <laughs> And then everywhere you go, like, like you, you, you've got to watch these social distancing queues and, and you stand in the queues before you check your bags in. Then you check your bags in and everybody's standing far apart and then you go through the security check. And then there are some people that are social distanced and some that can't get closer to you if they worked at it. And then, and then we've got these signs and then there's these announcements. Ding, ding, ding. South African Airports Company invites you <laughs> to be incredibly secure. Please maintain social distancing. Help us help you. Ding, 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 ding. And then you, then you get on the plane. And then everybody is in each other's space. And, and like you're like in there, in there. And then they say, mm, sorry, we can't help you with your baggage because of our no touch policy. But people have been touching your bags all day. And touching your bum and your shoulders and excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And it's weird. And you sit in this incubator of germs and some little granny can't get her bag into the overhead thingy. <clears throat> Anyone looks at her? COVID. Can't help you, COVID. <laughs> and then some person feels sorry for her and helps her with her bag and the bag is bigger than her and we get it in. And then they come, this is my personal favorite. We won't be serving any beverages on the flight yeah. <laughs> or food for your protection and ours, but then they give you water. Yeah. Listen, please airlines. <laughs> Coke Zero is nicer than water. <laughs> Why is it dangerous to drink a Coke Zero but not a water? Is it that <laughs> Then, because I'm not addicted in any way to that substance, I, I take it with me onto the airplane. And then someone will say, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Just let you know, you cannot have it bringing your own beverages onto the plane. I'm like, hmm, really? <laughs> so they walk past. <laughs> That's what I do, genuinely, I, tell, I promise you, I drink my own beverage on the plane, and when they go, and they hide it when they come past. Like you do when they tell you to turn your phones off. Yeah. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> and and, and why, why is it less dangerous to drink a water on the plane? And you've got, why, why is it less dangerous to swallow than chew? Yeah. <laughs> you can swallow a water, but you can't chew food. Yeah. It's perplexing. And then you look at, you turn around on the plane and it is packed. Every row packed. Big people, small people, round people, tall people, people packed in. And then they say, no, you can't come to church. It's not fair. And that's what we kind of, kind of live at. And then the problem that we have with the statement of it not being fair is that it's because we think that life is fair. Yeah. We do that as parents, come on. As parents, let's face it, if you've got more than one child, when you pour a cool drink, you make sure the other one is level. Yeah. Because heaven help the home if one is different. <laughs> so we make them level so that they, you buy one chocolate for the one child, you have to buy another one for the other because it has to be fair yeah and then we breed this into our homes we breed this into our schools I remember when our kids were little and I'm not knocking schools but maybe I am but when I was, we, we would we read schools and then there would be this participation thing going on like they're playing sport, and then everybody gets an award for rocking up so I just decided one day that I'd like to understand the psychology behind this so I went to a teacher and said why does does everybody get an award Oh, because everybody participated and we want to make everybody feel special. I go, but some of them are useless. <laughs> like if you're playing cricket and you, the bat is upside down, 
your participation is futile. If you can't throw a ball, don't be in a ball sport. It's not being nasty. It's being pragmatic. You know what I'm like? You know what I mean? Like, like it's like trying to play golf with a straw. You, you, you can participate all you like. You still suck. And I, I like, and then there's no, no, but you've got to make all the kids feel special. That's so cute. And then you think about it, oh, that does make a little bit of sense, but then not. Because what we've done is we've taught our children that life should be and is fair until it isn't. And then what happens is the wheels come off properly, like properly, properly, because life is not fair so they they go to school and or varsity or they come wherever they find themselves and then they find that life isn't fair so some people respond differently some people riot some people decide that they'll protest and loot every shop in South Africa oh sorry shouldn't say that politically incorrect they loot every shop in South Africa because <laughs> life isn't fair right like, and then and then we we start being upset with each other because the environment isn't as fair as it should be and we start accusing everybody of discrimination don't we then we start to want to take things away from people who've worked really hard for them because we don't have them. Chaos ensues. And I know that's not politically correct, but it's still true. Then we have the other group of people who don't necessarily behave that way. Their particular world, it just becomes absolutely overwhelming. Life isn't fair. The circumstances in which I find myself aren't fair and everything starts to fall apart. They descend into very dark places because they're unable to, rec- uh, to, to reconcile that life isn't fair. Yeah. Life has never been fair. Who told us that life would be fair? Yeah. Where do we ever see that life is going to be fair? We all know this though. We work in the workplace. We see that some people who don't deserve it get promoted. Yeah. We see that. Life's not fair. We know this all through school and university and and, and college and so on. We see that some lecturers like some students better and give them better grades. It's how it is. Life's not not fair. Sport teams, we know this to be true. Just because there's a referee doesn't mean that the referee is unbiased. (laughs) Ask Mr. Rasmus. (laughs) It's not always fair. In South Africa, we have this interesting problem called taxis. Taxis can go in any direction, at any time, stop anywhere, at any point in time with apparently no recourse. Life isn't fair. It's unfair. But who said life should be fair? And when we find that life isn't fair, we start to measure the, our contentment based on our comfort levels. So we start to go, hey, listen, uh, because it's not going my way, life is unfair, I'm unhappy, things aren't going according to plan. And we become difficult people to live around. So maybe we need to shift the way we think. So over the next few minutes, we're going to be looking at a subject called living with unfairness. How do we live life in an unfair world? Living with unfairness. Because if we can see the differences and some learn some little tips and tricks that will guide us from the Word of God, how to live differently, we won't be broken by unfairness. We'll learn to manage and overcome unfairness. You being helped today? We need to move forward. So we're going to look at this. And one of the places we're going to start at is God's instruction book for life, the Bible. God's instruction book for life shows us that life is not fair. All the way since the beginning of time, life hasn't been fair. In fact, in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you've ever taken time to read Ecclesiastes, it's quite a mouthful. But even the word sounds hard to say. Try and say that when you've had six beers. (laughs) Or gone like this with air sanitizer. Ooh, big problem. But what happens is, is that when we start looking at Ecclesiastes, a very wise person wrote this. The fastest runner doesn't always win the race. That's unfair. And the strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. Yes, that's unfair. The wise sometimes go hungry and the skillful are not necessarily wealthy. That's also unfair, right? And those who are educated don't always lead successful lives. Again, yes, unfair. But maybe you go look at that and go, well, hey, I'm not convinced that the Word of God or the Bible is in fact the Word of God, so I'm not sure I can take that to heart. Well, you can't really argue with nature because you see it. And I don't know whether any of you have ever watched uh, Nat Geo Wild or Animal Planet or something like that, and and you've been watching it, and then this particular little impala tiptoeing through the savannah, wah, it gets taken on (laughs) by a lion and ripped apart. And we're going like, why is that image on the screen? Because life is, but is it really? I guess it's a little unfair for the impala. 
but for the lion? Is it unfair for the lion? Like a lion can't dial up Mr. D and go, yo, I'd like an Impala steak. So like if the Impala gets away, he goes hungry. How's that fair? I mean, I've never watched anybody watching any animal program ever when there is a lion or a predator about to pounce on, a, on prey. You, like, like you never hear, you never hear, get him lion, get him leopard, rip it apart. No, you go run Impala, run, 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 get away, look behind you, he's there, no, 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 go, go. Like why do we do that? That is so wrong. We want life to be fair, but who's fair? The problem with fairness is that it's often a matter of perspective. You see, unfairness is a matter of perspective. Have you ever watched or read any of Aesop's fables? You should read them. Little stories, short stories, short paragraphs, if you like, that carry a strong moral. Look at this one. Speaking of perspective, it's uh, an Aesop's fable called The Heifer and the Fox. The Heifer and the saw a fox hard at work, harnessed to a plow, and tormented him with reflections on his unhappy fate and being compelled to labor. Shortly afterwards, the harvest festival, the owner released the ox from his yoke and, and but bound the heifer with cords and led him away to the altar to be slain in honor of the occasion. The ox saw what was being done and said with a smile to the heifer, for this you were allowed to live in idleness because you were presently to be sacrificed. You see, we look at some things as being unfair, but it's just a matter of perspective. Think of it like this, sports teams. Someone has to lose, someone has to win. Isn't that a little unfair? But we like it right now because the Springboks are killing everyone. It's awesome. <laughs> For those of you who are fans of the British and Irish Lions, sorry. <laughs> Not even your ref could help you. I mean, sorry, I never said that loud. But I, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Uh, look at this. It speaks of the fact that our eternal life is unfair. God had Christ who was sinless take our sin so that we might receive God's approval through him. For those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we need to recognize that that is unfair. God was unfair. Unfair in a good sense for us, unfair to Jesus. Jesus, sinless, perfect in every way, paid the price for the rest of us who are imperfect in every single way. Isn't that a little unfair? And the reason we don't complain about that unfairness is because we're on the right end of that unfairness. The reason for that is we interpret only circumstances which affect us negatively as unfair. When we're the recipient of good things, the unfair is determined fair. So unfairness is a matter of perspective. So as we navigate this journey through life and we say life is unfair and things aren't going according to plan, we also need to remember is that it's not always unfair from someone else's perspective. Because life is always unfair to someone. It's about, about, it's about perspective. So part one, we're going to be looking at understanding unfairness. Understanding unfairness. You ready? Here's the first thought. Unfair things happen to good people. When you're in the midst of something that may be deemed unfair, it has not necessarily got anything to do with the quality of your person involved. Yeah. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Yeah. That's unfair. Unfair things can happen to good people. Yeah. In fact, there's a great story about this, a, a true story about a guy by the name of Cornelius Dupree Jr. He was sentenced to 75 years in prison for the rape and robbery of a 26-year-old woman. And he professed his, his innocence the whole time. Somewhere along the journey, he was offered parole on the basis that he would admit to becoming a sexual offender, to which he said, whatever your truth is, you have to stick with it. And no, I am not a sexual offender. So he could have been released early. He served 30 years after DNA tests proved that he was, in fact, innocent. 30 years he served for a crime he didn't commit. And this is what he said. What did happen, happened. It's in the past, and in order for me to get my life back together, I have to forgive. He lived a life 
where he was restricted and the whole journey of his, of his 30, last 30 years was removed from him. Life is unfair. But it's how we perceive it, how we respond to it, and how we act around it that changes everything. In fact, there's another great account in history of another person who was charged with sexual assault and was also innocent. His name is Joseph. Now, Joseph was an interesting cat because you see with Joseph, he had some interesting things going on for him. When he was a youngster, he had an unfair treatment as he grew up. His father loved him more than he loved all the other brothers. So Joseph received unfair, favorable treatment in everything that he did. Long story short, he was sold by his brothers into slavery. A little unfair. He found himself sold to a guy called Potiphar. And he was a slave to Potiphar. Now Potiphar had a wife. We'll call her Mrs. Potiphar because we don't know her name. Mrs. Poe for short. And Mrs. Poe saw Joe. And she knew just where to go. So Poe said to Joe, let's go. He said, no. And that's where we pick up the story. Genesis 39 verse 12. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come sleep with me. Translated, let's go. Joseph tore himself away. I wonder how many of us would have done that. But he left his cloak in, in her hand as he ran from the house. Verse 14, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave. He had to make fools of us. And he came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. Verse 20. So he, Potiphar, took Joseph and threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him his faithful love. Interesting. Joseph did the right thing on anybody, in, in, in anybody's standards. He did the right thing, and as a result of doing the right thing, was falsely accused of sexual assault, was locked up in prison. And when we look at that, we go, that's unfair. But what we don't recognize until we finish the full account is that after that, Joseph became one of the most influential, powerful people in the known world at the time because of God's faithfulness. And the story behind that is as simple as this. It might seem unfair and life is unfair, but it doesn't have to cripple us. It doesn't have to define us. It isn't permanent. At some point, it will change. It's confirmed by Habakkuk 2 verse 3. These things will surely come to, say it with me, surely come to pass. Just be patient. So unfair things do happen to good people. But they don't need to be things that define us, restrict us, or limit us. This too shall pass. We'll see a change. Just be patient. Being helped? Yeah. Number two. Things that may appear unfair are sometimes just healthy tensions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This is so important. We touched on it that unfairness is often a matter of perspective, right? So if unfairness is a matter of perspective, we also need to get our minds around the fact that maybe we are perceiving things incorrectly. That the very things that we think are unfair are simply healthy tensions because not everything that is unpleasant or disappointing is unfair. In fact, some of the very things that we call unfair are the tensions in our lives that give us strength and equip us and help us to be better people. A good example is bridges. If you look at civil engineering, Bridges are a good example of this. A, a suspension bridge has a set of cables that are attached at each end of the bridge, but they are pulled or tensioned in opposite directions. And it's the very nature of that tension that holds the bridge up. If we try to remove those tensions, the bridge will collapse and fall. It is the tension that holds the bridge up. And sometimes what you and I try to do is we, we look at what we think to be unfair. We look at these tensions and we try to remove these tensions because we think they're unfair. But it's the tension in and of itself that is giving us the strength we need. But that's a bit inanimate because it's a bridge. But how about, how about ideas? Ideas, different ideas can be tensions that we think are unfair. We can come up with a great proposal, a concept, an idea, an idea, a philosophy. We present it to people who we hope will respond positively, yet they have a different idea or they contradict our idea and we get annoyed because life is unfair. But it's the very tension of that disagreement or that difference that helps us to be creative and, and to think differently and to establish new concepts and ideas and to grow something new. It's different, different ideas become the very tensions that help us to grow. And if we're not careful, we try to 
pray away those sources of different ideas. We want them removed because those sources of different ideas are messing with our mojo. But it's that very tension that helps us. We must be careful that we don't try and remove the very tension that is giving us the strength in the first place. Another Aesop fable called the hawk, the kite, and the pigeons gives us ideas into this. The pigeons, terrified by the appearance of the kite, called upon the hawk to defend them, and once, at once he consented. When they had admitted to him into the coat, they found that he made more havoc and slew a larger number of them in one day than the kite could pounce upon in a whole year. Aesop's fable goes on to say this, avoid a remedy that is worse than the disease. We must be very careful that we don't try and get away from the tensions, the very things that are establishing great strength in us. Another tension that we often think is unfair is conflict. We don't like conflict. No one particularly enjoys conflict. But the reason for this is because we think of conflict as a win-lose. But if we change our perception a little and look at conflict as a win-win in which both parties can talk and communicate and grow together and learn together, we can see things differently. In marriage, we try and avoid fights because the conflict causes pain and discomfort. But the point is, when you and I have healthy conflict, we grow. Think of gymming for a moment. When you pick up that dumbbell, if you're doing a, a bicep curl, gravity is in conflict with your muscle. And as we start pulling it up, depending on the weight of the weight, it might be really difficult. But the conflict once overcome starts to develop muscle. And what we need to recognize is conflict, conflict often brings strength. That's why in any organization, in any country, a, a good opposition is needed. In political terms, we need a good opposition party. Why? Conflict matters. Yeah. Different ideas matter. It's important to grow and to develop. We need to have different thoughts. And in, in, in history, we find a great example of this even within the church. Two great leaders, a guy called Paul and a guy called Barnabas, had an argument. They conflicted around a particular way, way of doing things. Paul and Barnabas agreed that they would go on a missionary journey and they then started arguing about who would go with them. And we pick up the account in Acts 15, 37. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. And when we read that, we can go, oh, wow, that's a bit hectic. There was a, a separation. But what we do need to remember is that, yes, Paul had a lot of uh, good reason for not wanting John Mark because John Mark had bailed on them. He did. And Paul was right, but so was Barnabas because Barnabas believed in John Mark. The two of them had a different view on who should come along. They disagreed so sharply that they separated ways. And instead of one missionary journey taking place, God used the conflict to have two take place. Twice the impact, twice the speed. So the very conflict that we face might seem unfair because Barnabas, it would have been very unfair that he wanted to take John Mark. Paul would have been flabbergasted that Barnabas was being so unreasonable and unfair that he wanted to take John Mark with him. Yet the perceived unfairness was a conflict that sped up the spread of the gospel. Why is this so important? Because sometimes the tensions that we see are not unfair. They're just changing and developing us. You being helped? Number three as we come to a close. The next thing that is often unfair in our minds is things like this. When we see that there is imperfect balance or a lack of balance, we think often that it is unfair. But can we stretch your thinking a little to say this? Lacking perfect balance in life isn't unfair. It's effective. That's not a politically correct statement because most of us spend our entire lives pursuing perfect balance. We must be careful with the concept of perfect balance because it's a, an idyllic utopia in which we believe that every part of our lives should have equal focus and equal attention and equal enjoyment. But that's firstly impractical and secondly has negative results. Look at this. The quest for perfect balance is a futile preoccupation that germinates the fruit of mediocrity. No person who has achieved significance in any field of interest has had perfect balance. 
it cannot be done. So if you and I pursue and drive after and chase after this idea of perfect balance, all we become is average at best. Something has to give. If we want significance in life, something has to give. We have to give up some stuff from time to time. And that might be hard to understand, but let's bring it down to weight, for example. If you want to lose weight, if you want to get physically healthy, you cannot just eat whatever you feel like eating and focus all of your attention equally on every food food type. Because if you keep eating all of the chocolates that you love, there will be imbalance. And when you stand on the scale, it's going to say, one at a time, please. (laughs) You have to say no to things you enjoy in order to see the benefit of something else. Yes? Studying is no different. How many students have you heard say this? Yeah, like, university has got to be the most fun time of my life. I'm going to leave home. I'm going to stay in res and just enjoy life. What? (laughs) My kids have a hard life, man. Because if they go to university and they want to go to res, I'm paying. I determine their social life. (laughs) Because you see, if you want to pass university first, sacrifice some of your social life. You can't have perfect balance. I'm going to spend eight hours socially, eight hours at university, eight hours reading, eight hours in gym. You've already run out of time. It can't be done. So if you want to do well at university or at school, you've got to sacrifice some things you love in order to do something that you need to achieve. Imbalance is needed. But if that's hard to get your mind around, how about money? If you want to be significant with your money, there has to be imbalance. You have to spend less than you earn. If you spend what you earn, equal balance, perfect balance, thou hast nothing. You have nothing. It will make you poor. You have to have imbalance. You need to spend less than you earn. You need to save more than you spend. There's imbalance. In business, you cannot run your own business and keep taking everything out of the business. You've got to put stuff into the business. You with me? Does it make sense? And maybe you think, listen, I would much rather than these strange analogies, Trev, have some biblical evidence of this. Thank you for asking. We'll get straight to it. Proverbs 30, verse 18. Are you ready? Proverbs uh, 30, verse 18. Three things amaze me, says this wise person. No, four things I'll never understand. Here they are. How an eagle glides through the sky. How a snake slithers on a rock. How a ship navigates the ocean. And of course, the most complex of all, how a man loves a woman. (laughs) Now, for the sake of time and my life sustenance, I'm going to skip the last one. (laughs) And we're only going to look at the other three for now. But think of it like this. When we watch an eagle in the sky soaring in the thermals, it looks magnificent and it looks like the eagle's doing nothing at all. But it had to work really hard by flapping its wings and fighting the thermals to get up there in the first place. So it went from one level of imbalance to another level of imbalance. A snake on a rock, no legs, no hands, no ropes. Yet it can go over rocks. How does that work? Well, it goes from one extreme to the other. It's, it's, it slithers up one extreme, goes all the way to the other side, sl- turns around, slithers the other way until it makes its way from one extreme to the other until it reaches its destination. It lives a life of perfect imbalance, which results in it achieving its significant goal. Think of a, a yacht on the ocean, a sailing ship on the, on the ocean. A yacht cannot sail directly into the wind. It has to tap. So like the snake, it moves away from its destination, tacks around and sails in the other direction and keeps moving backwards and forwards, tacking left and right until it makes its way gradually to the goal it has in mind. But it means that there needs to be one level of of, of extreme to the other. There is no perfect balance. The great Andy Stanley once said this, you need to choose to cheat. He's an American pastor, leader and author, incredible writer. Choose to cheat. In other words, there are times in life where we need to cheat on some things in order to be significant in others. There is no such thing as perfect balance. If you've had children, please understand, there cannot be perfect balance. If you want equal sleep and you want your child to be fed, your child's going to die. Dead. 
buried. Over. So you have to wake up and have significantly less sleep in order, in order to raise a significant life. There's never balance. And if we try to find this perfect balance, all we achieve is mediocrity because we do nothing significant. You being helped this morning? Yes. We need to realize that imbalance is not unfair. It's necessary for significance. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what Jesus did? Think of Jesus for a moment. If we think of these things for a moment, that life is unfair even to good people, Jesus experienced that. If we think of the things that things may be unfair, uh, that, might, that appear unfair or simply tensions that make us better, well, Jesus experienced that too. If we think of a lack of balance as being unfair, when in fact it's actually effective, Jesus experienced that too. Look at the person of Jesus. It was an unfair act of charisma. The Greek word charis, the act of charisma, dying on the cross. It was the act of charisma, the unfair act of charisma that has positioned each and every one of us as human beings on this planet for eternal life with Jesus in heaven and a relationship with him on earth. It is unfair. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father. Look at this. No one comes to the Father but through me. Isn't that a little unfair? Surely there've got to be other options. It would be fair to have multiple options, multiple journeys, multiple people through which we can step into eternal life. But there isn't. There's only one path to eternal life with God in heaven and a relationship with him on earth, the person of Jesus Christ. There is only one. Is it unfair? Yes. That's why Jesus said, he who believes has everlasting life. Not even he, not, not he who performs well has everlasting life. Which means that for some of us, we might be, hey, that's massively offensive. I've lived my life trying to be good. I've lived my life honoring God and honoring others and trying to, to be the best person I can be. And that means that this person who comes out of wherever is just completely broken and made so many bad mistakes and just believes and that person has right standing with God in heaven. Yes, that's unfair. Yes, it is. But remember, unfairness is a matter of perspective. He who believes has everlasting life, Jesus' statement. That is to say that you and I don't need to perform. We just need to have our hearts aligned with who Jesus is. Jesus, God with skin on, never once fell short of his, stand, of his father's standards, lived on earth for 33 years, allowed the very creation he created to humiliate him, beat him, nail him onto a cross on which he died. And three days later, another unfair thing happened. Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was raised to life. Which means if you and I can come to terms with that, we too can live in this amazing relationship, a friendship with Jesus on earth and in heaven. But it means we've got to accept his invite. An invite to what? A richer, fuller, more purposeful life. How? Just say yes. Just say yes to Jesus. Wherever you're watching from online, wherever you find yourself in this room, Say yes. In the recesses of your heart, just say yes. Yes to Jesus. Say thank you for being so unfair that you died for me. Yeah. And if you bow your heads in the room, everyone on, online, in the quietness of, you, of where you find yourself, just say yes to Jesus. And if you've done that, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray the right words. All you need to do is pray with me. That's it. And I'll guide you in a prayer that will help you to know that you've made the right commitment and, and have accepted Jesus Christ. You said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock and he who hears and opens the door and invites me and I'll dine with him and he with me. Jesus is saying, open up the door of your heart, welcome me into your life and we'll have a journey of, through life together. So come pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I'm sorry for my sins. Please come into my life and from this day forward, I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God a hand for each and every one of those people. 
online, if you've made a decision like that, why don't you just make a comment and on, this, on the, on the uh, facility you, you're watching on right now or send us a text, follow the, the directions, find our website, all of it's there. You can let us know. We'd like to take you on a journey. As for everyone inside the room today, if you've made that decision on the way out through the glass doors, you'll find a group of people holding a little book, booklet that says, I've made a decision. Grab it and follow the instructions there. We'll help you on the journey. In fact, there's a QR code on the chair back in front of you. You're welcome to scan that and follow the prompts. It'll show you where to go. But we are so grateful you made that decision because hey, your next step is fast forward. And uh, online, you'll find out more about that now, but uh, you all know what that's all about. Find out how you can get involved with fast forward. We'll take you on a journey that will accelerate your walk with Jesus. As for everyone, Father, we just thank you for everyone in the room and everyone online. We pray that you'll bless them richly as we learn to live with unfairness in Jesus' name. God bless you. We'll see you next time. We hope that you enjoyed that service and congratulations if you made a decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you send us a WhatsApp on 0827369668 and we'll help you with your next steps. We will see you next time.